All right, this is Dr. Martin recording the lecture for um, uh, the 17th. Uh, and actually, I'm recording it just a little bit late, so it may be posted late. Um, the um, What I want to cover today, uh, here's our syllabus. Let's go down to the end. Um, so, so here we are on the 17th. I'm going to, I am going to go over the ARM instruction set just a little bit. I'm not going to, I think, uh, since we're not doing the KL25C uh, Freedom Board, uh, which is kind of sad, but I, I just don't see how we can get through the logistics of getting one out into everybody's hands, and there's really no point in having one if we're not going to do labs with it, and we're out of time to do labs anyway. So uh, that's fine. So, um, uh, but I do, I, I will just talk about the instruction set a little bit. Just so you get an idea of a, of a different uh, assembly language instruction set. Uh, but obviously we're not going to write any programs in it. In fact, we, we never do do that. We, we always write these in C because this assembly language instruction set is not designed to be hand coded, although it can be, but it's really designed to be uh, uh, used to compile C code into. And it's m more efficient for that. Um, and it's a little, it's somewhat challenging to hand code it. All right. Um, Okay, so we'll do that. And then on Thursday, I don't think we'll talk about the peripherals per se or using it. Uh, what I'll probably do is review for the, uh, talk a little bit about the final exam and uh, still in, and encourage you in, in project. So I will set up a, uh, I will set up um, uh, a help session tomorrow. I'll try and set that up at noon. I will set out, send out an, uh, an email tonight, hopefully, and let everybody know that that's coming down. Um, and so if you need some help with your project, uh, you can come to the help session tomorrow at noon, and uh, I'll, I'll try and give you some help. All right, and so that takes care of that. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of this, and uh, I don't know why we have changes. I'm going to say, what the heck, I don't know. All right, anyway, um, so now I'm going to shrink myself down a little bit, and We'll do this. That should work. Okay, and I'll put myself up here. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, we'll talk about uh, okay. Okay, so, oh, huh. yeah, uh, well, that's interesting, uh, I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm confused, okay, I'm just going to get rid of this and try it again because it was totally confusing me. All right. All right. That's where I wanted to get to. Um, okay. All right. So, so again, just so you remember, the ARM instruction set is for the ARM Core M0+. Plus. Now, uh, this, is, this is called, it's also called, uh, it's also called, and I think I have to move myself to see this, it's a it's a it's called it's a 16-bit thumb instruction set. Uh, it's actually I guess I don't have the official name here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's the thumb two. Uh, and anyway, uh, it's mostly 16-bit instructions, but it does have six 32-bit instructions. And the 32-bit instructions are generally more complicated instructions. Can actually move several bytes, and typically those are the ones that can access. The, uh, the registers uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and, and uh, yeah, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Registers 0 through 7 are accessible to every all instructions, but only some can use the upper five uh, common registers. And there, again, are 13 of them. Pause this just for grins. Okay, that was a senior design team needing a little help. Um, okay, so um, 
so let's dig in. So, um, yeah, so, uh, the, uh, so our, so the fact that the instructions are 16 bit means you can pack a lot of instructions in. Um, so that's nice. Um, and, uh, and this thumb two does support a range of arm cores. So, um, the official name of this of the language is ARM V6 M Thumb 2. That's the official name. And um, the M0 plus core is like the it's like the lowest end of the of the of the cores supported by this Thumb 2. And it, anyway, uh, it, it um, yeah. So the KL25Z runs everything in privilege mode, so there's no user mode capabilities uh, for the, you know for this chip. All right, uh, so I'm not going to go over the registers again. We've already talked about well, I will briefly, but there there are R0 to R12 are the 13 general purpose registers, and again the lower eight R0 through R7 are the ones available to every instruction. Then there's a stack pointer which is 13, uh, and we only have one. There actually are. There could be two, but uh, they didn't implement that when uh, when Freescale uh, built these chips. They didn't implement the the two stack pointer uh, functionality. And then there's a link register that's R14. And then there's the program counter that's R15. And then there's a status register. And the status register uh, has several fields in it, but the only one that that is uh, any of real any real interest to us is the uh, th where the 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 four status bits are located and um, all right so data resides in memory so every memory location uh, in the random access memory and I guess for that matter in the in the um, in the flash uh, read-only memory every location represents an 8-bit byte if you put two of those bytes together you get a half word and if you put four of them together you get a word and if you put uh, I don't know, uh, for eight of them together, you get a double word. So all the processor registers are 32 bits. And uh, the all the word 32-bit uh, references and all the half word references have to be correctly byte aligned. And what that means is uh, the words have to start on location 0, uh, 4, 8, and C whereas the uh, half words have to start on even locations, like 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, A, D, C, E. Uh, but byte references can, be, uh, can, can start on, on any, any address number. They don't have, they, there's no alignment to those because every address is a byte. Okay, and so... Um, Targeted at compiler generation, not hand coding, and that—that's it is a, it's it's really not a regular instruction set per se. Um, some of the constraints are not generally consistent, and it's it it's a, uh, yeah, and it's really optimized for code density from C code. All right, so um, there there are several different data types that you can hold in a register. You can hold the 32-bit pointer, so that'll point to any location in memory. It'll you can have unsigned or signed 32-bit integers. You can have unsigned 16-bit or 8-bit integers zero in zero extended form. Now, what that means is you have 32-bit registers, so you you have to do something with the empty space. They're always right justified, so they're slid down to the right side of the register. But what about like in a 8-bit uh, uh, integer? You have 24 bits in the upper part of the register that are basically not being used. So what do you have to put there? Well, typically you zero extend for unsigned, and for sign you do sign extend. And then you can have uh, you can have unsigned or signed 64-bit integers held in two separate registers. All right, so this this uses the, the concept of load and store, <clears throat> and load means you pull information from memory and store it in a register, uh, and put it in a register, and store means you take information from a register and store it in memory. 
you're allowed to transfer bytes, two, two bytes are a half word, and four bytes are a, uh, a full word. And, uh, yeah, to and from memory. And let's see, where's my, did I kill it? No, here it is, sorry, my bad. Losing it. All right. Um, the, the, uh, the, the load and store operations can transfer two or more words to and from memory. And you can load and store 64-bit integers using these instructions. But there's no other real direct support for the 64-bit stuff. That would be like a, like a double. And that's, a, that's an assembly language. Of course, in C, it's supported. Um, all right. So we've talked about the uh, signed and unsigned formats. And it's just the, un, the unsigned are just stored... Um, you know, 0 to 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. Um, so if you have a 32-bit, so it's uh, so it's 32 minus 1 or 2 to the 31 minus 1. All right. So like an 8-bit number, so that's 8 minus 1, so that's 7. So that's 2 to the 7th. 2 to the 7th is... Uh, is uh, 256 and um, uh, let's see okay yeah so th this um, these unsigned numbers go from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1 so if n is is if n is 8 that's 2 to the 8th is 256 minus 1 so it goes to, to uh, uh, 255. 0 to 255. The, the, the 2's complement representation goes from minus 2 to the n minus 1 to plus 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1 because you, you, you only get half the value. So, you're, so in 8 bits, you go from minus 2 to the 7th to plus 2 to the 7th minus 1 or minus 128 to plus 127. That's, that's how that is. That's, that's true... It's the same. It's the same truth for any any unsigned and signed n bit number. Okay, uh, so your integer arithmetic you can do bitwise logical operations, shifts, addition, subtractions, multiplication, and uh, and then in the in the manual they'll 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 describe these operations using this pseudocode. Uh, a pseudocode is it's just syntax and operators defined in the in the ARM manual. And it shows you how these instructions actually work, uh, but it's not actually part of the thumb code. It's kind of confusing. I, uh, when I read through the manual, it, they spent a lot of time with pseudocode, and it's super boring because it's useless. It's simply an, a way of explaining what it does, and um, I found it kind of tedious to have to learn that for no other reason than to understand how it was operating. And most of the time, I didn't really care as long as I understood what it would get, you know, what the answer was going to be. Uh, but for some things, it's nice, I guess, to know exactly how it's going to do it. Um, all right. So anyway, um, okay. So you can do logical shift left, and uh, I guess you, you, the uh, so when this does it, it moves each bit of the bit string left by however many bits you specify, and then zeros are shifted in at at the low order end, the right end. And bits that are shifted off the end of the bit string are thrown away, except the last bit shifted out winds up in the carry. So if you only shift one, it goes into the carry. Uh, logical shift right moves each bit right by the specified number of bits, and zeros are shifted in at the left end. Bits that are shifted off the right end are discarded, except the last bit winds up in the carry. So, so you, you, if you only shift one bit, it would go into the carry, regardless of whether you shift left or right. That's logical shift. Arithmetic shift. And, and in logical shift, you load zeros at either end, the opposite end that you're shifting towards. Arithmetic shift right moves each bit of the bit string right by a specified number of bits and copies the leftmost 
uh, copies of the leftmost bit are shifted in. So if the leftmost bit is a zero, you get zero shifted in. If the leftmost bit is a one, you get one shifted in. So it, essentially it's sign extending. It maintains the two's complement sign of the number as you shift it right. And bits shifted out uh, the right end are discarded except the last, last one winds up in carry. So if you just shift one bit, it winds up in carry. And rotate, rotate right. Uh, notice there is no arithmetic shift left. Rotate right moves each bit of the bit string by a specified number of bits, and each bit that's shifted off the right end is reintroduced at the left end. The last bit shifted off the right end of the bit string can be produced as a carry output. So, so the bits are the bits are not shifted through carry; they're shifted out the high, out of the well. In the case of right, they're shifted out the low end and immediately back into the high end. So you're just rotating the number, but the bit the last bit shifted, or if you only shift one bit, the bit that's shifted winds up in the carry. All right, and then we have, uh, these are the status bits, N, Z, C, and V. Now, what's interesting here is we have a bit that represents that the number is negative. We have a, a, a zero bit, so if that's a one, it means the number, the number is zero. The last result was zero. If the C bit, that's the carry bit, and the V bit, is uh, is when you do a mathematical operation, uh, the carry and let's say you have an uh, if you do unsigned numbers and you get an overflow, then you would check the carry bit for a one to see if it overflowed. But if you do a two's complement, uh, say addition, you check the v bit because the carry bit uh, may very well show an overflow, but it doesn't mean anything because in two's complement math you ignore actual overflows out of the register, but what you don't want to see happen is adding two negative bits resulting in a positive, or adding two positive resulting in a negative. And that's what the v-bit represents. The v-bit represents two's complement overflow. All right, um, so the, the this chip is a, it's a memory mapped architecture, which means that, that everything is mapped into the memory, the, the address space somewhere. All the I.O. registers, uh, all the program locations, all the random access memory locations, it's all mapped into this four gigabyte address space. Um, and all bytes are always treated as unsigned numbers, and they go from zero to two to the 32nd minus one, which is four gigabytes. This, is, this address space is regarded as consisting of two to the 30th 32-bit words, but uh, it's but each location is actually a byte. But you do have to think of it. Uh, but the 32-bit words have to be byte aligned. They have to start on zero, four, eight, C, and back to zero. And if if you uh, try and do an unaligned uh, access to the memory, a, a store or a load, and you want to do a word but you don't have it on uh, a location that, that whose last uh, last four bits are 0, 4, 8, or C, you're going to get an error. And if you try and do a 16-bit one and it's not an even location, you're going to get an error. All right, let's see, I'm not going to go, this is basically the address, uh, which the address space goes from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 hex all the way to F, 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 hex. So it's a huge address space. And and it's carved up sort of like this, but uh, lots of stuff is kind of smeared all over the place. And so you don't have to really worry about this. And we're not, and again, we're not going to program this. When you write in C, you don't have to pay much attention to that anyway. Uh, and obviously only a small, teeny part of that address space is actually filled up by the by the RAM and the flash. Uh, the flash is, you know, the flash is 128K. Well, that's that's way less than the, the space set aside here. So, okay. Um, so little end -end format is how things are stored. And the way we normally represent that then is byte, we put byte zero to the right, the next byte, the next byte, the next byte. So this would be the high order byte, this would be the low order byte. And a half word looks like this. 
Uh, however, the instructions, uh, for whatever reason, are uh, switched around. And uh, the low order four bits, the low order, the low order two bytes for a 32-bit instruction, well, the 16-bit instructions are set up like this. But if you use a 32-bit instruction, it's set up, it's got the, the, it's got the, the low order byte here, the next byte here, the next byte here, and the next byte here. So it's, it's presented as two half words with the first half word on the left. Uh, don't ask me why. Uh, but it, apparently it, uh, it makes, makes it, it allows you to read it slightly more naturally for some reason. All right. Um, okay, most 16-bit instructions can only access eight of the general purpose registers. I've already said this. And a small number can do the high R8, R9, R10, R11, R12, and so forth. The general purpose registers stop at 12, but, but some of these instructions can also get to the program counter, the stack pointers, and some of these other registers and, 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 and manipulate them as well. Um, the conditional execution uses this 16-bit conditional branch instruction, and it gives you a branch range of plus or minus 250, uh, yeah, well, 256 to plus 254. The reason it's plus 254 is that the instruction you're on counts for, uh, I, it's, it's at zero is the, is the instruction after you, the instruction you're on. Um, all right, and these instructions use the, the, the status bits, the negative, the zero, the carry, and the V bits. All right, so we have, we have these are the instruction types, branch instructions, data processing instructions, which would include st standard things like ands and ors and exclusive ors, shifts, multiplies, packing and unpacking instructions. That has to do with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, taking uh, eight, eight bits and moving it um, into a 32-bit register and then packing it and unpacking it. And likewise, you can move it out of the register and into an 8-bit location if it's an 8-bit value. So, but you have to, you know, so it sort of has to get unpacked from the register because the registers are 32 bits. And then status register uh, instructions where you basically do conditional branches and then loads and stores. Oh well, I guess yeah. And other things like uh, moving, re loading the uh, stack pointer and things like that. And then you have your load and store instructions, where you're writing and reading memory, and also other memory locations. And then the load multiple and store multiple instructions, where you can move more than one byte at a time, more than one word at a time. And then there's some miscellaneous things, like interrupts and things like that sleep and some other things. All right. Uh, I can, yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all these. I think I may just stop with this because we have talked about them a little bit, but what, what is nice is you do get this. Um, you do have some, some of these, uh, 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 branch instructions that aren't conditional branches that have a greater branch range. Um, and then here your data processing add with carry add uh, I don't know I, I don't think I'm going to go through these it's really not important but uh, you can kind of see um, we have we have uh, th there are some fancy ones like love load multiple uh, we, we we do we can uh, pop multiple registers off the stack we can push multiple registers onto the stack uh, and you can store multiple. So these are these are some of the, the fancier instructions. Um, and then here's some real you know miscellaneous ones where you can set up uh, you can set up restricted areas in memory uh, and uh, no ops. And then these are the these are the interrupt send event supervisor call wait for event wait for interrupt yield. These are things that would be used if you actually had the ability to run user code and supervisor code. Uh, but this uh, this chip runs everything in supervisor mode anyway. So, uh, and then these are the conditional branches, which are kind of cool. It really does give you a, it really does give you a, 
a lot of ability to, to, to branch on a whole bunch of different conditions. Um, some of these are set up for unsigned comparisons, and some are set up for two's complement based comparisons. And so it's it's really cool in that regard. So here we, you know, branch equal. So that's z equal one. Uh, and then here, and where is it? Unsigned. Uh, yeah, well, so here's like, uh, uh, no, I guess it doesn't. It's not uh, unsigned. So unsigned higher, unsigned lower, signed less than, signed greater than. So, so unsigned lower or same, uh, sign less than or equal. So you can see where you do the unsigned lower or the same, you check the carry bit and the uh, or the z bit. Carry bit equals zero or the z bit equals one, then it's true. Here, you check for the z bit equal to one, or the uh, n bit not equal to the v bit. So it's kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, so, so so when you're dealing with signed versus unsigned, that they the, these instructions get a little weird. Okay, I'm gonna move this over a little bit because I keep disappearing. All right. Okay, let me just take a little time now, uh, and I want to talk about a little bit of a review of C. Maybe this will help you doing your project. Uh, I had actually intended to do this earlier in the course, and uh, for whatever reason uh, we didn't do it then, and so now I'm gonna do it now. Uh, but I think this is important. I do know uh, if some of you got a really good uh, C course and some of you may not have. Uh, I do know that Bob Apollon uh, is doing a great job, but uh, some, but uh, he's in our department. Uh, some of the folks that take C and CS, it, it varies. Um, sometimes we, we may uh, have an experience where we have a TA that's a little less interested and may not be really dialed in to uh, writing code for embedded controllers. Uh, and so sometimes they get a little esoteric. Anyway, uh, so if you miss some things, then uh, then uh, hopefully this will be helpful for you. So, uh, all right. So I there are, you, you, you should have a good reference book. I don't know, it's funny. Kurgan and Richie, uh, Kurgan, um, or Kernigan, I guess it is, and Richie, and I forget which one. But both of them were intimately involved in, in writing the original C language. He's still kind of the guru. Uh, you'll still see him quoted, and his take on things is really still considered gospel. So that's a nice little book to have. It is This 1988 printing is hardly the first edition. Uh, it is in Lord knows how many printings now. Uh, and then there's several others. But, you know, just getting a book like, uh, you know, uh, Idiot's Guide to C Programming or, you know, one of those type books. Um, it's good to have that, though. Um, is C around forever? It, well, let me just say, uh, I first learned to program on an IBM 1620 back in 1963, I think it was. And um, Fortran's still being used. But that was the language I first learned, and as well as machine language. The IBM 1620 is not being used anymore, but Fortran is being used. I wrote Fortran a number of years later when I was in graduate school in the 70s. Um, and, and even today, there are people still using Fortran programs. Um, so I doubt that C will go away for many, many, many years. Now, whether or not it's going to be the language taught as sort of your first uh, main introduction to computing language, uh, probably not. Uh, I, my guess right now is it looks like Python is kind of taking over. I know MIT has been teaching Python as their intro to programming for a good while now. Um, I, I don't know how long Python will last, but I will say this. Uh, Python has a lot of power, mostly because of its libraries. Uh, but Python has some features that are nice that are a little more friendly than C. Um, and there are some features of C that drive people crazy that Python doesn't have. So, um, so I, I, you know, so I do think that eventually we'll probably see, no pun intended, uh, Python taking, taking over the sort of the primary, uh, you know, computer programming, uh, 
tool that you need in your toolbox if you're going to be an engineer or a, a, a CS guy. Uh, but C is still going to be used, and it and for and for embedded controllers, it's still used. I, all all the all the latest uh, uh, integrated development environments now pretty much come with assembly and C. Um, and then if you want Python, you're probably going to have to go get a third party. I don't. Need, I have yet to see a Python a Python compiler for embedded programming. And part of that is what one of the real strengths of Python is it's it's the the NumPy library and some of those other libraries that allow it to do really um, fairly efficient uh, data analysis we don't we don't tend to you know if you're going to do data analysis you're going to sit down with a powerful laptop or a desktop with multiple screens and and then you're going to do your data analysis in that world um, and for that you probably need python but uh, if you're doing an embedded design you don't normally you're not normally looking at you know a data set with you know uh, you know, 10 million exemplars in it. You don't have that kind of memory. So there are, I guess there are a few exceptions to that now. There's a, there's a little single, single board computer that, uh, that's got uh, multiple cores and is made, uh, and is basically made to, 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 to do AI on a single board. But anyway, so, uh, so C program mostly consists of functions and variables, operators, um, and uh, there are a number of different types of statements. There's a declaration statement, assignment, a function call, a control statement, and um, null. Uh, it's a strongly it's a strongly typed language, so all the variables have to be specified a, as to what type they are. Um, and every pro, every C program has a, a main function. And you you have to that's where your that's where your control is turned over once the once the program's all loaded, so the main is is where things start. All right, so variables can have uh, letters and digits. Uh, the underscore character can be used to improve readability of long variables. C has five basic data types. Void, which is no data, char or, or or character, however you want to say it, uh, which is in typically is a single letter, uh, and in that ASCII used to be always a you know a seven bit value. These were always eight. These were bytes, and uh, so chars are typically bytes. But this is machine dependent, and then ints ints vary on whether they're sixteen or thirty two bits or whatever. Maybe even some defined as 24 bits. Floats, uh, floats have typically been 32 bits and double 64 bits. Uh, with the introduction of, of some new IEEE 754 standards, uh, then this may we, we may see some changes in these types. But typically, float has been an IEEE 754 uh, 32 bit floating point number, and the double's just been the same thing only in 64 bits. Um, the void type is used when you basically want to indicate that that uh, a function is not going to return anything. Uh, a variable of the type char holds a single byte, and a variable type integer uh, can it, it is machine dependent uh, on the on in the uh, in the uh, MPLAB X compiler for our uh, mid level. Um, pick parts, it's 16 bits. A float is and a, and a double, as I mentioned above, are always 32 and 64. And then there are qualifiers called short and long that can be applied to the integer variables. Um, it, you have to look up every, every, different, every different compiler. It may be different on this, so you just have to look that up to see. But Typically, short is going to be 16 bits and long 32, although there could be um, different numbers. And then integers are uh, integers and chars can be signed or unsigned. By uh, by default, uh, they're they're signed. All right. The uh, so variables can consist of 
Again, letters and digits and the underscore character can be used to improve reading. Uh, I don't think the underscore character is, at, is in itself actually used uh, as part of the name. It just helps you read it. So if you didn't, if you left it out, it, it should still be recognized. Okay, so we did that. Um, so here's some examples. Integer, I, J, K, char, C, X, C, Y, uh, integer, M equals zero. So you can, you can specify the initial value in the declaration. And then uh, char echo equals y. So the, so the name of the variable is echo. And in this case, it's set to the ASCII character y, which is always set up in single quotes. And of course, you could put any ASCII character in there, lowercase, uppercase, whatever. Constants. So there's a type constant, and they can be integers, characters, floating point numbers, and strings. Uh, and uh, a character constant, however, is a single character in single quotes, like you saw up here with the Y. And a character constant is just its ASCII code. Uh, probably want to keep an eye on that. I suspect that will change over time. Uh, at some point, maybe. I don't know. It's been that way for a long time, though. But but now we're using... Uh, we're, we have... Uh, you were moving away from ASCII a little bit uh, so that we can represent all the other character sets in the world, including ch Chinese and symbols and all sorts of other letters and, and then the, the letters in Spanish and French and uh, German that have uh, other characters in them, like, like the Enye and, and uh, the Umlaut in German and the Grave in French. Um, okay, uh, we do have strings. Uh, a string constant is a sequence of characters and you surround that in double quotes like hello world. And then you count how many characters and spaces there are. And then there's one additional character at the end when this is stored that is uh, a zero location, which represents the null character. And this allows uh, programs to be written to automatically know, be able to find the end of these strings because it can all be different lengths. And then integer constants, um, yeah, are just the same same size as, as an int. In this case, uh, 16 bits for our chip. You can you can do a long constant, and you just you just follow it with a with an L. And you'll see that sometimes um, when we specify a, a defined statement, we may specify a a long constant to indicate the frequency of our processor. All right. Um, we can use different bases, decimal, octal, hex, and binary. They're all legitimate. And then we have operators. Uh, plus is add, minus is subtract. It's also the unary minus, the unary plus. The star is multiplication, and the forward slash is divide. And if you're using integers, then it's always going to truncate the quotient. Um, let's see. Uh, the percent sign is the modulus or the remainder, um, but you can't apply those to floats or doubles, only integers. And then uh, plus plus is increment, and if you precede the variable, it'll pre-increment and then use the variable. If you put it after the variable, it'll use the variable and then increment post-increment. And same with that, nine, minus minus, same thing. So there, there are a bunch of bitwise uh, operators. There's the um, bitwise and, bitwise are. There's the exclusive or. Um, and then there's the, uh, in, the bitwise inverse or not. And then there's right and left shift. Um, so the ampersand is often used to clear one or more bits. Uh, whereas the OR is used to set one or more bits, and the uh, exclusive OR is used to toggle one or more bits. We've talked about this at great length. Um, the shift can be moved to uh, to multi to move the operand to the right, uh, 
and you can specify how many places. So shift X, Y, Z, right three, three, three bits. You can also shift it left, specify number of bits. You can also uh, combine these operators with the, with the assignment operator. So you can do ampersand equal. So that means take this value here and and it with the value of the operator. Uh, sorry, well, with the value of the left-hand variable, PTH here in this case. Uh, same with here, you're ORing PTB with X40. Here you're, uh, you're shifting XYZ right three places. And here you're shifting it all left four places. So these are just for efficiency in writing the code. Um, so we also have relational and logical. Remember, these logical operators always return true or false, and that's represented by a 1 or a 0. So and here's some examples. And I, I'm, uh, I'm going to move on, I think. Uh, so if else, so you can have an if statement, and then you can also have the else part, which is optional. And then you can also have uh, this a question mark colon. So what you do is you put this information to the left of the question mark, and that is basically, this is what you evaluate. So it's a logic statement. If it's true, then you select B and set that equal to R. If it's false, you select C and set that equal to R. Okay. And uh, then, uh, you can have multiple condition. You can have if, else if, else if, else if, and finally else. Now, the first one of these that evaluates true aborts any more execution, and, and it does it executes the statements. You can have more statements if you use curly braces, and then it's finished, and it doesn't go on to the next else if, else if or the else. Okay. Um, the switch statement can be thought of as just a long list of if else's, and uh, it's there's an expression in the switch statement, and then then there's this uh, this constant expression, uh, and so you can define the different cases. Like you can give names of the month or uh, a number of different things can be used here. Uh, a lot of times we'll just use an index. We'll use an integer here, and then case when in the integer is one, we do case one. When the integer is two, we do case two, and so forth. And you can often have, you should often have a default statement, so that if it it doesn't match any of the available cases, then there there's usually a problem. But at least you can you can you can have a default statement that says print out an error. This comparison uh, was bad, and then you can terminate the program or leave it run and see what it what it was. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Uh, for loops, you guys are aware. You know, def you've definitely used these. And uh, sometimes we'll do an infinite for loop. We'll just leave all these blank and put in the two semicolons in the parentheses. Uh, so expression one and expression three are assignments or function calls, whereas expression two is a relational expression. So these can actually be function calls. Um, and here's some simple examples. So if you want to execute this 10 times, you start at, you, uh, well, normally we start at 0. So I think in this case it's only going to execute 9 times because it didn't start at 0. All right. And here, yeah, I don't know why they're, usually I, usually we, I would, by convention, we usually start, if we want this to execute 20 times, we set i equal to 0. And then when we compare it to less than 20, when it, when it gets equal to 20, we're really on 21, 22, depending. So then we have the, uh, then we have the, the do while statement. So we have a while and an expression statement. So we use that a lot. And then the do while, which is not used quite as much, but you'll have a while, and it'll appear uh, typically with uh, um, 
So we, we start with the do. There's no conditional or anything up here. We just write just write the do, and then we write all the statements we're going to do, and then at the end we have the while with the expression that's evaluated. Now, the, the difference between the while and the do while is the do while always executes the statements at least one time, whereas the while will not execute the statements if the condition is not true. And the while will continue to execute as long as the condition is true. That's also true with the do while. So as long as it's the do while, as long as the expression and the while part at the end is true, it'll keep executing. But it will always execute once, even if the initial expression is zero. Okay, let's see. Um, then we have put character, get character, and uh, get character echo. Uh, and so we, we include these routines so we can use the printf statement, which has all this formatting capability. This printf statement d d formats it, but then it puts it out using, using put character. Yeah, we have, it's, it's, uh, for some reason this example is all screwed up. Okay, so I think that's, um, I'm not gonna say a lot more about printf, just to say that normally in embedded programs, we'd like to avoid printf if we could. We use it a fair amount just because it does let us uh, format things nicely to be printed out uh, on our terminal program. But uh, if you're really generating a, um, an output program, you, you probably want to avoid printf. It's a lot of code. It has a potential uh, to uh, go off the rails rather easily if something gets a little screwed up in its call. Um, and so, so it's uh, it's better to avoid it if at all possible. Uh, here are the conversion characters, and there's all sorts of rules, uh, minus signs. Um, there's a number that specifies minimal field width, the period that separates the field width from the how many digits after the period, a number, the precision that specifies the maximum number of characters to be printed from a string or the number of digits after the decimal point, or the minimum of digits for an integer. And then uh, if, the, uh, if the integer to be printed is short or long, or you use, if it's short, you use an H. If it's long, you use a L. So, so here are a number of the conversion characters. There's also one for just single characters as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I don't think I'm going to go through this. Uh, function prototypes. To use functions, uh, we normally have to define them before they're encountered. And so we, we often will put them as function, as a, we put what's called a function prototype at the header. Then we do our main function. And then we usually put our actual function definitions at the end. Now, if you put all your function definitions at the beginning, then that works out okay. Then you can, then you don't have to have the function uh, prototypes. But it, the function prototypes are a nice feature. It, it also, uh, yeah, it's a nice feature. Um, all right. And uh, pointers. So I'm not going to talk too much about pointers, but uh, these are very important features and also uh, arrays. Uh, so we have, uh, we have two operators that go with our pointers. We have the dereferencing operators, the star. And basically this, 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 means what C, so let's say CP is a, is a pointer and AX is a pointer too. Uh, AX is an integer pointer and CP is a, is a char pointer. You cannot uh, put the value of a integer in a char pointer. Well, I don't think you can anyway, uh, because the, the pointer math is totally different on chars than it is on ints because ints are usually a byte uh, sorry, uh, ints are usually at least two bytes and maybe four bytes, whereas a char is a single byte. And also there are float pointers and double pointers and, uh, and the whole nine yards. So you really should know what, what kind of pointer you have. Okay, um, so the way we set these up, uh, so uh, let's say we have an integer A and then we have the star B that when we write this unit, unitary operator star in front of the B, it doesn't mean multiplication. 
it means it's the dereferencing operator when it appears in a unitary fashion like this with no other variable. And what it says is that b is going to point to an integer, that it's a pointer, and it's going to point to an integer. So that's the type of pointer it is. And the reason that's important is when you do math on pointers, the C system has to know what they're pointing to to know how to do the math. Because if you say b plus 1, uh, but it's an integer, it's actually going to add 2. If it's a float, it's going to add 4. If it's a double, it's going to add 8. If it's a char, it's just going to add 1. So it, it really makes a difference um, what type of pointer it is, and that's why they must be declared as a type. And then you have to keep that type correct. All right. Um, so if b is defined as a pointer using this syntax, and, and it's really just a syntax here, uh, that's just how we do it. So a is a variable. Let's say then then after this, let's say you set a to some value, right? Or well, or you set well anyway. So here, let's say b is pointing to some variable. This would take the the value of the variable that b is pointing to, and it would assign it to a. So a lot of times we'll go the other, usually, typically we'll show it the other way. We'll show star b, equal, star b equals a. But what you can do, anywhere you can use a variable, you can, you can use a star pointer, uh, and it accomplishes exactly the same thing. When we want to assign an address to a pointer, we use the, we use the, the um, addressing operand, the ampersand. Again, if it's used with two operators, it's, it's the bitwise anding. But when we use it by itself in a unitary fashion uh, or unary fashion, it's a, it, it, is, it is the addressing uh, operator. So here we defined IP as an integer pointer. We defined X as a pointer and Y as a pointer. Here, X, the, this ampersand X means the address of X is, is a set equal to IP. So now IP is pointing to X. And then if we do the dereferencing operator on IP, star IP, that's exactly the same as writing X there. And then when we say Y equals star IP, we're basically saying Y equals X. Okay, so arrays are actually... Um, an, uh, just another way of representing pointers, uh, and uh, it seems like they're totally different, but they're really they're really not. And internally, in the C language, it immediately changes arrays into pointers, um, and you can actually use pointers like arrays. Amazingly enough, so we use square brackets for arrays. If we want a single-dimensional array, we just use one set of square brackets and a and an index. And if we have a two-dimensional, we use two sets, and three-dimensional, three sets, and so forth. Uh, so um, when, we, when we declare arrays, we put the number of elements in the brackets. So x uh, bracket 100, close bracket, that would set up 100 locations and say that's uh, defined as an int. So that would be 100 integer locations. And they're numbered 0 to 100 minus 1, or 99. The actual value of 100 is an illegal uh, index. You, you, there is no array element 100. There are 100 of them, but there's 0 to 99 because we always start with 0, which is, which is definitely can be very confusing. Okay, so just double check yourself. Make sure you remember that that initial, that initial value uh, is uh, is the number that are in the that are stored in the array, but it's in itself illegal. Uh, you, you have to do that number minus one to get the top the the last element of the array. The 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 row designations here the the uh, two dimensional matrix definitions here are always row column, and that's how they're stored. They're stored a row at a time. Uh, all just uh, touching end to end. So 
So any operations that can be achieved by array subscripting can also be done with pointers. And, uh, and generally, the pointer version might be even be a little faster. Uh, so it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go through all this. Uh, what I am going to do, talk briefly about passing these to a function, and then I think we're going to quit. When you want to pass, uh, when you so functions uh, have their uh, their arguments passed by value. In other words, if you pass x and y and z to a function, they don't get the variables x, y, and z. They get the value of the variables x, y, and z. And then if you modify those in the function, thinking that you've changed your original x, y, and z, you're, you'll be sadly disappointed because you haven't changed a thing in the main routine or wherever, whatever module, whatever function called that function. Because all you passed to the new function was the value of the variable. You didn't pass the actual literal variable. But you can do that if you pass a function. You can also do that if you use a external or if you use a global. And so that can get a little confusing, but that, that is correct. All right, so, um, so we can also pass arrays in, in our, our function. And we can also, uh, uh, we, and we can pass pointers too. All right, so an external variable, a variable defined inside a function is called an internal variable. A variable defined outside of a function is called an external variable. And an external variable is available to essentially all the functions in that same uh, in that same uh, uh, program in, in that same file anyway. External variables provide uh, provide an alternative to function arguments and return values for and 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 also it allows different functions which don't call each other to uh, to communicate between them by using these external variables. So the use of static, so if you have a function, you can declare a variable inside of it, static, if you want that variable to, uh, to remain in existence between uh, subsequent function calls. If you don't declare it a static, then when the function call is over, that variable will go away and, be, uh, and disappear completely. So if you have a function and you set inside the function, you declare a variable a, and you set a equal to 10, and the next time you come into that function, you expect a still to be 10. If you didn't declare it as static, it's going to be gone, and it will not still be 10. Scope is another thing to keep in mind. And scope, apply, scope refers to the range in which the variable is available and, and stable. Um, so you can, you can definitely have... You can definitely have your source in multiple different files. You can have uh, the, 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 so the scope of a name uh, can be uh, restricted to just inside of a function, or if you're using an external variable, it can be across your entire program. Um, so there, there are definitely, uh, you definitely have to pay attention to the scope of variables. All right. Um, all right, I don't think, uh, yeah, I'm not going to. Uh, typecasting, you can force a variable of some type into a variable of a different type by, by putting the new type in parentheses before the variable. And you do this when you're doing calculations with mismatched variables. This forces them into uh, the new format so that then they're, they're in the same format as all the other variables. And you can, you can get better calculations that way, more accurate. Um, and then uh, we can do inline assembly instructions. So even if you're not writing assembly code, you can have a, uh, you can use a few assembly language statements or even several uh, doing what's called inline assembly instructions. So you can actually be moving along in your C program, and then you can actually write a few assembly language instructions, and then you can continue. Uh, there's different syntaxes for this, and these are machine dependent often. So you, you really need to consult your manual, uh, your compiler manual for, for the machine you're using 
uh, in this case, our PIC chip to see if uh, how it's going to handle these inline assembly instructions. There are certain rules you have to follow. Uh, there are some variables you're not allowed to mess with. So uh, if you're going to use the W register, for instance, uh, you, you may have to save that first. Or uh, if you're going to use uh, an index register, you may have to do something differently there because uh, the C program will have used some of those resources and you need to be aware of what, what you have to pay attention to. So it's been very useful. Uh, uh, there are some things where it's uh, where for critical timing loops it can be really helpful. Okay, uh, style. So just a couple of thoughts on style, and then I think I'm going to quit. Um, so on, one of the things on style is we 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 do want to have our programs to look nice and to be easy to understand to debug and to pass down so that other people can maintain your code. Um, so there are three primary ways you communicate what, why you're doing, what you're doing and how you're doing it. One is you should have meaningful names of your variables, uh, meaningful names of constants and functions. And you should have comments frequently in the program that explain various steps. And then finally, your, your, your program appearance. You should use spacing and alignment and indentation to, to, to communicate how you've grouped portions of the program together. It's also when you're using curly braces and have multiple uh, statements after, say, a for instruction or a while loop or uh, a do while or an if statement or an if else or an else, you should really make it an effort to... Uh, to have those uh, clearly demarcated in a way that you can you won't you know you won't be confused when you uh, 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 are trying to figure out what something does. Um, you should normally have a header that says who wrote the program, what the program does, uh, and if there's complicated portions of it, you should you should explain what those are supposed to be doing. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Yeah, we talked about this already. Um, these are some good suggestions. And then here's a good example. Notice how these patterns are all very readable. All right, uh, I think that's... Um, so proper spacing, proper indentation, vertical alignment, all really important steps. Um, so this this code with all these curly braces, it's real hard to read because they're all everything's all jammed up to the left. Uh, but when you space it out like this, it, it is more it's easier to see what's what you're doing. So you have an internal four here, you have another four here, and you have one there, and then you have a while, and you can see the nesting. It's very clearly shown by the by the indentation. Another really important thing is when you when you set up a constant, just by a little work, you can line them all up here. Makes it really easy to count them. Makes them easy to see if one's missing a letter. Uh, it's 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 really very helpful. Now sometimes they they aren't all the same size. Okay, I get that. Then you can use spaces to help line them up. And um, yeah, your, your names of variables, constants, and functions should give some indication of their meaning and purpose. Um, and then you can adopt uh, specific standards for variables, for functions, uh, for constants. All right, I think with that, we'll quit. Um, I will send out an email. I'll try and get all the, uh, all the, all the practicums graded. Uh, be sure you're working on your projects. I will do send out an email for the help session. Uh, that I will do tomorrow at noon. All right.